Okay. Well, a pleasant good afternoon to all the attendees, participants uh, at this afternoon's panel discussion on CARICOM Regional Action on Disaster Risk Reduction and Management. So it's my pleasure as uh, the Acting Director of the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies uh, to welcome you all, panelists and attendees, uh, to this event. So we are happy to begin this discussion on disaster risk reduction and management. And we have a fantastic team of panelists with us here to discuss this, uh, this matter. So as you know, the Institute of International Relations is the premier tertiary education service provider in international relations and global studies. We've been operating since 1966, and uh, the Institute has been a home to many who are now regional leaders in uh, a variety of fields. It's a way for many persons to transition into a career from languages, law, economics, engineering, natural sciences, uh, into uh, this wide area of international relations. And we have uh, from the diploma in international relations all the way up to the PhD program. We have supported the foreign services of our region and further field as they train their own personnel in the area of international relations. So the IR is unique. We have both the academic and the practical training for our community, our practitioners, as well as for the scholars. Our faculty, um, includes an experienced group of academics in the field and with our contacts, both our regional and international contacts, we contribute to the development of the University of the West Indies in the particular area of international relations. And today, our chosen topic for analysis and discussion is disaster risk reduction. And uh, obviously this is a very important theme it complements many of the discussions that we've had recently. We've had recently a discussion in December uh, last year on US elections and the implications for US-Caribbean relations. We also have a, a series, an ongoing series of diplomatic dialogues, we call it. And the last one was on South African's foreign policy and its global relations. So as you see, the Institute is always working on trying to bring to um, public discussion and debate issues that are of relevance to the region. And what could be more relevant than disaster risk reduction? Caribbean islands, as we know, are highly vulnerable to natural disasters, uh, made more vulnerable because our economic and his historic vulnerabilities, the nature of our, of our economies, our insertion into the global trade regime, our relative uh, isolation from large markets, etc. And over the years, uh, disasters have cost us quite dearly. You know, we have natural disasters um, on average, according to a 2018 World Bank study that has cost the region about 1.6 billion US per year over the last 20 years. An ECLAC study in 2020 noted that the financial impact of natural disasters on small island developing states in the Caribbean region has been invariably larger than the GDP of several of the islands. And then a 2018 study noted that, for example, the 2017 hurricane season resulted in over $100 billion in damage for just 12 Caribbean islands. Many of us remember some serious storms. Erica, for example, in Dominica in 2015, cost the island $1.3 billion in damages. Hurricane Maria in 2017 caused Dominica um, approximately 226% of their GDP. These are sobering figures, but we don't only have hurricanes and storms. You know, the 2010 earthquake was a global disaster for the entire, uh, the entire globe as we, as we saw the, the damage that it did in Haiti costing over 250,000 people their lives. So what can we do? What has the region done on disaster risk reduction? How are we facing these events? Well, Caribbean small island states are proactive. 
We have been working through our regional agencies, for example, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Response Agency, Emergency Management Agency, the support of the UN, World Bank, United Nations Development Program. We also have the support of partners, including the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescents, the Caribbean Development Bank. We have a lot of public-private partnerships. And of course, the, uh, the guidance and support of uh, the, uh, the universities in the region, many of whom are represented by persons on the panel today. And uh, the pandemic has contributed even more to our concern uh, to develop proper systems for disaster risk management. And some of the people on our panel today can also speak to how the region is managing the pandemic as an added uh, pressure on, uh, on the, the area of, of disaster risk reduction and management. So briefly, let me tell you about a, a wonderful um, group of panelists. We have Dr. Joseph. She is a Caribbean volcanologist, director of the UE Seismic Research Center. She has over 17 years of experience in the field. Her colleague also, uh, Dr. Lachman, has over 48. Dr. Lachman has over 48 years of experience in Eastern Caribbean seismicity. Um, being involved in responses that date back to 1974, when Antigua had that uh, important earthquake, and then in 1974 and 77 with Kikim Jenny eruptions. We have um, um, Ms. Uh, Elizabeth Riley, now the Executive Director of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. Ms. Riley has over 20 years of experience in regional and international disaster management specializing in technical programming, strategic guidance, and more recently, she's also involved in the coordination of the region's response to the COVID pandemic. We have Dr. Fontaine, a scientific director of the Volcanological and Seismological Observatory of Martinique from the Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris, Paris. Uh, he has his PhD in geophysics and also substantial experience in seismology working not only in the region, but also in the South Pacific. We have Dr. Moretti, also a scientific director with that same institute. And his research is about reactive properties of earth materials, particularly magnets and flu fluids, and their application to understanding the volcanic processes and the monitoring of volcanic activity. And last but not least, we have Ronald Jackson, who now heads the Disaster Risk Reduction and Recovery Team for Building Resilience uh, at the United Nations Development Program in Geneva, Switzerland. Ronald Jackson served for seven years as Executive Director of CIDEMA, and prior to that, he also worked as Director General in the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management in Jamaica. So between them, our panelists have probably two centuries of uh, involvement in disaster risk management. And Dr. Latchman is laughing, but that's true, right? And we're so pleased that, that they, these experts in the field could take their time, take time off from what we know are their busy schedules to join us this afternoon and to share with us their perspectives on how the region has managed disaster risk management um, over the last uh, many decades. So the format for this afternoon's event uh, um, is as follows. The format will begin with uh, the uh, presentations and, uh, and uh, of each of the persons on the panel, 10 to 15 minutes they each have. We have wonderful timekeepers that will ensure that although we know that each of you could speak probably for days on your topic, we are limiting you to this short time frame. And we'd ask you to please keep to that uh, um, time frame. After which, we'll have a critical summary from Dr. Kara Niles from the Institute of International Relations and expert on environmental affairs as well. And uh, after that, we open up the, the room for conversation, question and answers discussions, both from the panelists and from the attendees as well. And, uh, we wrap up events at three o'clock. So without uh, going any, um, continuing, at least not from my side, I'd now like to 
um, introduce and encourage our colleagues from the Seismic Center to make their presentations. And we begin with um, Dr. Joseph and Dr. Latchman. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scobie. So I will begin by giving a brief introduction on the work of the Seismic Research Center. And I will let Dr. Latchman, who is our seismologist, take over with respect to the uh, sharing information on seismic risk in the region. So you can go ahead and share. Joe. Yep, hang on. Great. So the, for those who are not familiar, the Seismic Research Center, we're the primary source of information for geohazards in the English-speaking Eastern Caribbean islands. We monitor seismic and volcanic activity in these islands. We help to mitigate the effects of these hazards. Um, we conduct research on the processes involved in these geological hazards. And we most, one of the most important things that we do is we, edu we, ed we have a, a education and outreach team and they assist with educating the public and various stakeholders in the islands in which we operate on these hazards and how we can prepare for them and help mitigate the effects. We provide early warning on volcanic activity to vulnerable islands in the territories in which we um, operate. Next. So um, this is a, a map that shows the islands in which we operate, the Seismic Research Center. We were established in 1953 under the, um, uh, administered by the colonial um, government. Therefore, once a decision was taken to establish monitoring, um, the under British rule, uh, the areas of our responsibilities became the same from St. Kitts Nevis all the way down to Trinidad. Um, our current area of responsibilities includes 13 live volcanoes. Next, I and now I'll, will hand over to yeah, Dr. Lashman. <laughs> I'll take it from here. So, seismic risk is results from the seismic hazard, the exposure and vulnerability. So I'll talk at fair length about the seismic hazard, a little about the exposure and vulnerability, uh, primarily because quantifying seismic risk is very dependent on us knowing what the exposure and vulnerabilities are. And we are currently in the process of determining that seismic hazard, as Dr. Joseph said, we have been monitoring earthquake activity in the Eastern Caribbean going on 70 years. So we have, and we do have historical accounts going back to when Europeans first came. So I'll give you some of that information. We will look a little at our seismic or Eastern Caribbean hazard maps and what contributes to seismic risk. The Eastern Caribbean is a subduction zone. And uh, is everyone seeing my cursor? Yes. So the, what you find is that the Caribbean plate is overriding the North American, South American plates. And that is giving rise to the earthquakes and volcanic activity we have in the Eastern Caribbean. We can have earthquakes that occur in the crust of both the Caribbean and the North American, South American plates. And those are described as shallow earthquakes. And these depths are important with regard to the damage potential of the earthquakes that can occur. And then we can have earthquakes occurring in the descending slab. We can have earthquakes occurring. So those earthquakes are called tectonic earthquakes. And those that are occurring as a result of magma rising back to the surface are called volcanic earthquakes. So we have our Caribbean plate, 
wedged between the North American and South American pleats moving relative to those pleats eastwards. We, as I, we said, we have been in operation since the 1950s. Our historical accounts date back to the 17th century, the first earthquake we have in our database occurred south of Nevis in 1690. And you will note that all of those that are larger than magnitude 6.9, we have about five north of Martinique, five between Guadeloupe and Mart between Dominica and Martinique, and five south of that. So we have had large earthquakes in the Eastern Caribbean. That is part of our reality. And for, and for that, we should plan. Our largest earthquake occurred on the 8th of February in 1843 and is estimated to have been located between Guadeloupe and Antigua. The second largest is considered to have occurred north of the Para Peninsula, west of Trinidad. The one close to Antigua is estimated to have been between magnitude 8 and 8.5. So while the seismic level in the Eastern Caribbean is not like what you would see in Japan or Chile in that their large magnitude earthquakes occur every 10 or so years, and our largest earthquakes like the 1843 earthquake is estimated to occur every 100 or so years, the size of the earthquake is on par with those that we can find anywhere in the world. The I saw a seismal plot of the damage that was caused as a result of the 1843 earthquake shows that we had an area from St. Kitts to north of Dominica that experienced damage such as landslides, heavy damage to structures going down towards north of Martinique. We had intensity eight, which would be collapse of buildings that are unreinforced, intensity six all the way down to Grenada. So it is not as though an earthquake can occur, a very large magnitude earthquake can occur close to one island and only that island needs to worry. Earthquakes have the potential to extend their damage across our region. And a strategically located earthquake in the middle of our arc can inflict damage across the entire arc depending on its magnitude and depth. Here we have the significant earthquakes in our region. Going back to 1955, I have highlighted those in the sevens and sixes as those that were on land because we can have an earthquake that when it occurs in the sea, magnitude 5.8 earthquake, we have those three to five almost every year. And uh, they would not cause significant damage. But with that same earthquake to occur on land at shallow depths, you could have a city being devastated as happened in 1972 in Managua City. So here we have, and we will observe where the captions are, that these earthquakes have been generally well-spaced across the time period since 1955, going all the way down to 2013. You see a little cluster here, and that's because some of those that were less than magnitude six have been included because they were on land. But you will observe that since 2013, that we have had earthquakes of magnitude six. Every year, one year, we had two somewhere in the region. So we did not have any for 2019 and 2020. 2020, and of course, 2021 has just started. So some researchers would describe this kind of activity as accelerating activity in the region. And sometimes that kind of elevation is precursory to a most significant magnitude earthquake. Here you would get a general sense of how the earthquakes are distributed by depth across the region. And I said, as I said earlier, you have the shallow earthquakes occurring both in the Caribbean plate and in the North American, South American plates. So the red ones are 15 to 35 and the 
fuchsia ones are zero to 15. So these are our shallowest earth weeks. And were they to have a direct hit as happened in Haiti in 2010, you could have that kind of damage depending on the quality of construction. And something that we should note is that earthquakes are not in and of themselves disasters. It is disasters are caused by what we as human beings do and how we do not cater for the hazards to which we are vulnerable. And as we go west, the earthquakes get deeper and our deepest earthquakes are under the territories and a little towards the west. So how do earthquakes cause damage? So we can have damage because of the shaking. And here we have an example of old structures in Dominica being damaged in the six earthquake that occurred north of Dominica in 2004. And Dr. Here in Lachman, sorry to interrupt, just to let you know that you have five minutes left. Certainly. And here in Haiti, you have complete devastation in Port-au-Prince. You can have landslides and rock slides as happened here in China, and you can have liquefaction because the ground shaking causes soils that have been man-made, reclaimed land, and you will have this kind of damage. The buildings can remain intact, but they can sink into the ground or fall over. You can have another secondary effect of fires, in 1906 San Francisco earthquake, you found that the fires completed the destruction that the earthquake caused. And of course, the, the tsunamis, there is not much that I need to say because we all know about the 2004 tsunami. Because of the awareness that the Seismic Research Center has had about the effect, potential effect of earthquake hazard maps were created in 2004, and these are routinely updated as more information on the seismic activity comes to light. And of course, we need funding to be able to do that. Anyone out there with funding is welcome to contribute to updating these maps, which were done in 2011. Disaster risk is expressed as the likelihood of loss of life, injury, or destruction and damage from a disaster. The definition of disaster risk reflects the concept of hazardous events and disasters as the outcome of continuously present conditions and risk. So depending on what we do, how we plan our urban centers, how we densify the populations, we can increase our risk even though the hazard is fairly constant. We should also note that there are times when the risk increases because the earthquake hazard is more imminent. So the more we reclaim land, the more we densify our population centers, the greater will be the risk. And if we don't do our planning, then the impact is going to be most significant. Preparedness levels are insufficient, deficiency in critical awareness, regional hazard maps need to be Updated, as I said earlier, anybody with funding, we welcome it. Poor risk governance, building regulation framework is ineffective. Consequently, building codes, standards are not enforced. Natural hazards damage mitigation as part of the planning system is not effectively enforced. Ex ante risk financing, woefully inadequate. There is much that we need to do to make ourselves risk ready. And as I said earlier here, some of the research that we have done suggests that our largest magnitude earthquake may be imminent. Imminent in a geological context is a little longer than human scale context and may still give us some time to be ready, but we need to do that now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lachman. That is a sobering account of uh, a need to take action soon and to take action as a region. And that is what we would be discussing, especially when we get to the Q&A. And, uh, and I think that your presentation highlighted the, uh, the great work that has been done um, by our technical experts on the question, particularly of seismic activity. 
and uh, that actually is a, it's a good uh, uh, a good way to, uh, place to stop and to introduce our next panelist because we now would move on to um, Miss uh, Riley from Sidima who has been working for years on the regional responses to disasters similar to the ones that you have mentioned and the ones that you've been uh, have warned us uh, probably imminent from a geological perspective. And so I'd like to welcome Ms. Riley to, to the panel and uh, invite her to make her contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Scobie. And uh, I want to say good afternoon to my fellow panelists. It's really an honor to be sharing the panel this afternoon with you. And I also want to extend a warm welcome to all the participants who are able to join us for this afternoon's discussion, which of course is a very critical one. I want to congratulate the Institute on its initiative in convening the panel. So our contribution this afternoon from the Sedima side is looking at the whole issue of regional action and disaster risk management. So what I'm going to cover this afternoon is to talk a little bit about the, the whole regional scope and what that means from the Sedima perspective, to tell you a little bit about the contextual issues that are informing how we have approached disaster risk management from a regional perspective. I also want to touch on some of the strategic documents that frame our interactions in building resilience to the hazards that impact our region. And finally, to perhaps leave a, a few areas which can trigger some conversation during the panel discussions on some of the realities facing regionalism and things that are changing that of course we have to bear in mind as we move forward. So Sedima is the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. And first of all, we are an arm of the Caribbean community. And that's a very important starting point for the discussion this afternoon, because the Caribbean community is about functional cooperation, how we work together as countries, and of course is enshrined within the space of the revised Treaty of Chagaramas. So the Sedima as an institution has its own institutional mandate, which is articulated in the agreement establishing Sedima, and it gives us essentially five specific spaces of operation, which are outlined on screen. I'll just touch on those quickly. So we probably are best known for mobilizing and coordinating disaster relief in the aftermath of events. Um, we also play an active role in supporting states in mitigating the consequences of disasters. And this is looking at reducing the impacts of those disasters. We have an information clearinghouse function and this function obtains both in emergency situations as well as in blue sky times. So if you come to the Sedima website, you will see an extensive repository of information on disaster risk issues, um, how we're seeking to work with sectors, for example, in building resilience. And uh, we work in partnerships. So this is encapsulated in the mandate for encouraging disaster loss reduction and cooperative arrangements and mechanisms. And those partnerships are very wide region, re reaching and uh, cover not just emergency times, but non-emergency times as well. I'll touch on some of the emergency partnerships a little bit later. And uh, of course, because we are here because of our participating states, we support them in the establishment, enhancement and maintenance of adequate capabilities at the national level. And that's a very important function because at the end of the day, the resilience uh, work has to be firmly centered at the national level if it is really to be realized. So we say regional in the conversation. What does regional mean in the context of Sedima? And it's shown on the map. 
on the right hand side. So we at this time have 19 participating states having gone through the process and officially accepting the Cayman Islands as our newest member in September of last year. So when we say regional, we treat with the 19 countries that are within the Sedima system having signed on to the agreement establishing Sedima. So let's talk a little bit about context. So we are all small states. Um, some of course you realize are island states. We have single island, multi-island. We have continental states, larger islands, smaller islands. And what does that all mean? It means that we are affected by a diverse range of hazards. There are of course common hazards that affect the participating states. And we also know that some of these hazards which fall under the categories of natural, technological, or biological hazards are also transboundary in nature. And we've seen that with COVID and certainly the implications of climate change are very much in the forefront. We also recognize that there's diverse capacity. If you look across our states, there are nuanced areas of strength and there are areas where countries benefit from the expertise of others or from regional um, arrangements to make sure that they're able to address these specific issues. And as such, the arrangements in the region are really about how do we harness those strengths across the 19 participating states for the collective good of all. And we do that through horizontal cooperation arrangements. I mentioned that we have strategic frameworks which we have bought into at the highest level in the region. And the critical one is our comprehensive disaster management strategy which spans the period 2014 to 2024. And the strategy is really all about resilience building as you would see articulated in the regional goal. And we have identified four higher level result areas, which we work towards collaboratively with our partners because uh, the diversity of partners who support our region have been working with us on elaborating the strategy. So we look at institutional strengthening, knowledge management to build the evidence base for these, um, decision making, sector integration, as well as community resilience. And there's a range of cross cutting issues as well. Subsequent to the 2017 events, we did work collectively also on a resilience framework, which articulates and answers that really critical question of what does resilience mean for the region? And it's built up around five very interrelated pillars, um, looking at social protection for the marginal and most vulnerable, enhancing economic opportunities, safeguarding infrastructure, environmental protection, operational readiness and recovery. I know a lot of persons are familiar with our response related work. So I've inserted this slide, which can be shared post meeting to explain a little bit about how we work collaboratively with our countries and partners to coordinate response. And as you can see, it's held together on the left hand side of the diagram by a very intricate governance arrangement where plans at the regional and national level speak to each other and um, facilitate the work of our development partners through the Caribbean Development Partner um, Group. And we work with all those partners through various operational procedures, MOUs, et cetera. And of course, on the right-hand side, we have a diverse range of teams that have been put together over the years to support various areas. And essentially, we draw on national level strengths and capacities, including those that we train through the Sedima system, to be able to build regional teams to help any country that wants assistance. All coordinated through our regional coordination center, which is top center of the diagram. And of course, our states are very critical to this arrangement. And we have four sub-regional focal points which support this, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Jamaica. And they have various resources, including warehouses, et cetera. So in wrapping up, key considerations. What are some of the things that we're looking at? What has been very successful for us has been the ability to coalesce as a region around a common vision. 
which is focus on agreed results and having the buy-in for those results by our development partners and various other partners, and this is through the CDM strategy. I think one of the significant strengths of this approach has been that it has driven resource mobilization in the region so that we're able to talk at a regional level to a lot of development partners, including some of the larger ones like the EU in how we channel the resources for the region. We've also benefited from collective representation and we know that there's strength in numbers. So we collectively um, articulate positions for CARICOM on issues related to resilience building. And uh, the key message of course, is that SEDEM is a system. So we all work together. So along with our regional institutions and Seismic is on the call on this panel and they're absolutely critical for helping us to understand what's happening on the seismic side, earthquakes, et cetera, and very active, for example, in uh, what's the effusive eruption now in St. Vincent. Three other points I just wanted to touch on is that the reality is that the humanitarian landscape is changing. We're seeing a lot of trends that are emerging where the importance of regionalism is growing um, over time. And there's certainly been a significant shift at the global level from globalization to nationalization. And that is why the regional institutions have been um, increasing so much in prominence and that factors into how we're operating. Sustainability of the regional arrangements, ours is the first global one of its kind, but there are a lot of issues that we do have to address here, including how we maintain these types of arrangements and the obligations of our participating states in doing the same. And finally, I wanted to mention really the threat of the principles of differentiation, where we have seen a lot of our participating states graduating from uh, eligibility for certain global financial envelopes. And this has implications for being able to develop as a regional system. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much for the opportunity to contribute. And I'll look forward to the panel discussion and to responding to any of your queries. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Ms. Riley. That was an amazing overview of uh, the regional response to disaster risk management. Particularly, it was it was good to see the CDM framework and uh, and how the states of the region are working together. It's heartening to know that we are the CDM is one of the first of its kind globally, and it speaks to to the intent of the region and the regional leaders and the members of the Caribbean community more widely to work together to solve common development concerns. And, um, and so thank you very much for that presentation. That leads us now to move into our next uh, set of presenters and there are two presenters, Dr. Fontaine and Dr. Moretti from the observatory uh, Martinique and Guadeloupe respectively speaking about their recent experiences in disaster, natural disaster management. Again, uh, they, they bring with them the wealth of knowledge from part of our region and we look forward to their comments and contribution. So Dr. Fontaine, Dr. Moretti, you have the floor. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to exchange with you today. Uh, so I'm going uh, to to come back to. Um, the, do you do you hear um, correctly? Uh, yes, we're hearing you fine. Uh, yes, thank you. And see your screen. Thank you. Thank you. So so I'm going to to come back to uh, some um, some new. Um, observation uh, obtained on um, Montpellier, uh, which is a volcano in uh, Martinique. So uh, I'm beginning uh, by um, just a, a short history uh, of the last, uh, last four eruptions of Montpellier. So since uh, 1635, we had uh, four eruptions. The, the, fir the first eruption was the Phreatic in uh, 1792. And, and it was also a, a phreatic one in 1851. Uh, and then um, there was uh, this uh, infamous historical eruption, which occurred in 1902 to 1905 in uh, Martinique. 
and uh, this um, eruption, magmatic eruption, was um, um, so generated a pyroclastic flow, which uh, destroyed uh, the Saint Pierre uh, city, and uh, also uh, there is another pyroclastic flow which uh, um, affected uh, Mont Rouge city, and um, so, so as you can see. Uh, Around around twenty nine thousand people died in uh, in the May nineteen two uh, event, and another uh, one thousand and five hundred person died in the event occurring uh, in August nineteen two um, in Martinique, and um, later on uh, the, the the most recent er magmatic eruption is the one in nineteen twenty nine uh, to, to nineteen thirty two. And this eruption uh, did not uh, induce uh, a loss of people, uh, but uh, so, some animals uh, died with this event. Uh, there, there was uh, also the uh, pyroclastic flow. So this is uh, just one picture of um, Saint Pierre City on the left uh, before uh, the, the, the eruption of May 192 and uh, the, the same city uh, after the eruption. And uh, just to, to give an idea, uh, it, uh, uh, so the city is at around seven kilometers from the summit of the volcano. And uh, so uh, it, uh, it is probably between the, in one, one minute and two minutes, uh, which, uh, um, which takes the pure plastic flow to, to reach uh, Saint-Pierre at this time. And on this um, picture now on the left, you've got uh, the extent of the devastated area. Uh, this is the the, um, the area which is uh, um, devastated after the, the blast, the, 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 the lateral explosion which occurred um, on uh, May 8, uh, on the 8th of May, uh, 192. And as you can see, uh, there was a pretty uh, big area. And uh, so you've got, uh, this, uh, all, all this area which, which is uh, affected. And also, if, uh, if we uh, consider the 192 to 195, in fact, there were several pyroclastic flow and uh, if we look in details, we can even um, see the, the extent here with the pink color, which reach uh, even another uh, uh, city, Mont Rouge. And uh, so th this is uh, again a big, uh, a big area for, for Martinique. And um, so, so what is also um, interesting in, in, in terms of uh, volcanology is that uh, for the 192 to 195 eruption, there was in fact uh, different stage, different phases. If you, um, the magmatic eruption was preceded by a phreatic eruption. And then during the magmatic eruption, there was both uh, what, what is called a Pelian Nuit Ardente, which um, correspond to a destruction of lava, uh, lava domes associated with lateral explosion. However, after a certain time, after August uh, 1902, there was a second stage of uh, the eruption, which, uh, which was with a gravitation, gravitational collapses of lava domes. So just to, to, um, to give some uh, indications of uh, the, the last two magmatic eruptions, uh, these two magmatic eruptions were systematically preceded by uh, an increase of uh, the felt seismicity and also uh, by the increase of the femoral activity. And the last uh, uh, femorals in Martinique was observed um, in 1970. And, um, but still now we, we still have uh, thermal springs and uh, some uh, um, 
in a, in a particular area, there is a presence of uh, hydrogen sulfate, sulfide. So the, the network in Martinique is uh, composed by um, 10 seismometers. Uh, we've got also on a network of, uh, for uh, monitoring the deformation with a continuous uh, GPS station and uh, ink inknometers. And uh, also we are looking at uh, the, um, the evolution of, of the water and gas at, uh, at uh, different sites. So we look at the composition, the, the depth of the, of the water table and the, the temperature and so on. And, uh, and for one river, for one particular river, the observatory uh, also um, has a, um, an automatic uh, detection, uh, system of detection for um, mud, volcanic mud flows. So, so as I said before, the last eruption uh, ended on uh, 1932. And um, so what, what is uh, new uh, in Martinique is uh, um, that uh, if we look at the volcanic uh, earthquake, I, uh, the volcanic earthquakes increase since uh, April, April, uh, 19, uh, April 20, uh, 2019, and as you see here, and uh, this, this plot uh, shows, shows you the, the number of uh, earthquakes versus the, the time. And as you can see, uh, for instance, here, between January 2015 and uh, April 2019, there was uh, um, basically around two earthquakes per month. And uh, when, uh, when you, you look after this date, you've got an increase and the increase is, uh, is observed both by manual detection and automatic detection. Flat and then the increase. And if we look, if we continue to look uh, further until uh, January 14, for instance, as you can see, uh, when you look at the cumulated number of earthquakes, this number increased uh, gradually, and then there was uh, even um, a more prominent increase uh, end of November. And, uh, and in fact, when you look in details, on the two first weeks of December, there, was, uh, there were around 320 earthquakes which occurred, which is uh, unprecedented um, since uh, a long time in Martinique. At, so at least for, for, for the last 40 uh, years. And uh, another observation we, we observe was that uh, deep earthquakes at around 15 kilometers of depth were observed in, um, since April 2019. And in November, a third observation was the, um, the presence of uh, volcanic tremors, which uh, also um, was observed by um, one of our seismic station and then by a several station. And uh, this uh, tremor, in fact, is typic typical of um, a fluid flow, like for instance, uh, a flow of gas uh, in, uh, inside the fractures um, you, uh, and this, uh, this tremors is characterized by um, harmonics, which means different bands of frequency uh, and uh, with multiple, uh, uh, which are multiples of, uh, of uh, fundamental frequency. And uh, so here it was a, a third observation of change. And uh, so this tremor was observed in November 2020. A thousand, uh, 20, uh, 20, sorry, and it was no, uh, not observed before. And uh, end of December uh, 2020, uh, we, we started to detect also uh, the, the observation of, uh, 
of uh, deterior of affected vegetation and uh, and we confirmed recently that this vegetation was in fact dead and uh, and this vegetation is uh, is here just here uh, and uh, this vegetation is in is uh, can be seen on google earth and uh, uh, and uh, we we then realize uh, measurements on the field and these measurements confirmed that there was a, a passive uh, soil degassing of carbon dioxide, however, without the presence of ephemerals. And on these figures, you, you've got both uh, the seismicity in November 2020 uh, on, on the top, and beside you've got uh, the, la the location of uh, pre previous uh, phreatic eruption. And, and as you can see, uh, if, and if you combine the seismicity in January, for instance, on, on the two first weeks of January, as you can see, uh, this area, and where I, I also we, we've got this uh, dead vegetation, uh, is uh, really uh, the focus presently of a ch change of activity. Dr. Fontaine, just to let you know, you have about three minutes left. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So to so let's go for the interpretation. For instance, for the, the increase of the volcanic uh, earthquakes, uh, uh, we, we think it may be due either uh, to a change uh, uh, induced by the increase of the tectonic uh, uh, earthquakes, as pointed out by my colleague, uh, Dr. Latchman, present uh, previously, or uh, another another possibility might be uh, that uh, the, the hydrothermal system of Mont Pelé um, could be reactivated. So it could, might be a change of this um, uh, hydrothermal system. To explain the, um, the deep earthquakes, and also we observe uh, long period events, we, we think that these deep uh, events uh, at 15 kilometers might be due to the, to the arrival of, um, of a magmatic uh, input in a deep uh, reservoir. And then to explain the volcanic tremor, we are thinking about the, the, the migration of um, gas, for instance, from uh, depth to the surface, and then from the top of the mountain uh, to down close to the, to the sea. And uh, so to, to finish and, and just uh, show you here a synthesis with uh, all the information and uh, also um, we've got hybrids events now, which are another signals which appeared on November, on November 2020. So um, to finish, uh, I, I would say that um, we've got uh, new signals uh, and even now observation which are visible on the surface um, that a change occurred uh, with Montpellier. And uh, we, that's why we are, uh, we are calling that it's a reactivation of Montpellier. And uh, if you are interested by our um, news and actuality, so please, um, uh, you can uh, visit our um, uh, web page or the um, Facebook account or Twitter account, and uh, you will have access uh, weekly. So we, we are producing a weekly reports now uh, to, um, to, to give uh, an update on the, the activity of this volcano. Thank you again for this opportunity to, to exchange with you. Well, thank you. Dr. Fontaine, this has been an amazing presentation that has really brought home the, uh, the urgency of the need for uh, regional responses uh, as we prepare, hopefully prepare as well as we can for this uh, another imminent uh, event uh, in the region. And um, those, those who have visited uh, um, and seen the, 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 the destruction that, that volcanoes have caused in the past. You know, it's, it's sobering to, to get this information from you and the clarity with which you explained the, the scope of the possible disaster is something that I'm sure is, is uh, prompts you know, urgent responses in the region. 
and that will be what we'll be discussing in more detail. So for those of us who've joined uh, uh, after we began, welcome to this uh, uh, panel discussion on regional responses to disaster risk management um, prepared by the Institute of International Relations at the University of the West Indies. And uh, we have over 100 participants uh, and uh, some persons have already put, been putting questions in the chat. So thank you for that. We will um, open the floor to further questions and we'll have a discussion among the panelists based on those questions um, as soon as we've finished with the panelists and their presentations. So thank you again, Dr. Fontaine. And now I would like to um, invite your colleague, Dr. Moretti, also from the observatory to um, speak about his, uh, his knowledge and his experience on disaster management uh, as well from Guadeloupe. So Dr. Moretti, you have the floor. Okay, can you see? Yes. Yes, yes, we see hearing. Okay, so you. just I try to give a, a quite broad overview of uh, things that, uh, of course, happen in Guadalupe with some emphasis on the volcanological side. I will not spend many words on the seismic side, also because there are people like John and Fabrice who uh, better place than me. So uh, I'd like at the very beginning to make a parallel, in my opinion, you have to realize that I come from Italy, which is a country in which there are many, there is also a big town in the south, which is Naples. Naples comes some uh, three, four million people, resident living there. So it's a big, 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 big attractor of risk. There is, uh, of course, uh, the convolution of many different vulnerabilities which are put together and imagine in the end the final risk is something very, very huge. And so uh, I make a parallel between the mega cities and Naples is a small mega cities and the small islands developing state. So even if Guadalupe and Martinica are not uh, independent state, but any, any way they can be assimilated to SIDS. And so what's nice to see is that, uh, what do they have? Even if the urbanization is completely different, the number of inhabitants is completely different, but anyway, they, I would say, surround a well-defined portion of the territory on one side due to the urban belt, on the other side due to the presence, of course, of the ocean, like in our case. And so they attract both megacities and small island developing states. They are attractors of, of all possible risks in that territory. And so they attract, they put, they gather all together the, the form of risks, all the ads up which become risk. And then of course, the, those are amplified. And uh, so you have an explosion, but there is also an explosion of small island developing states. I hope uh, with, the, with the end of the pandemics that this explosion will pursue because, uh, well, it was so nice to see tourists uh, coming uh, and stay here. Now it's, uh, well, it's not the same. So I hope that the new explosion will come soon. Anyway, anyway, both and small islands developing states are big attractors of risk. Well, those numbers show it quite uh, clearly. Eh? The total number of disasters, this is between, uh, well, during the 90s and uh, in the first decade of, um, of this century. Well, we have uh, more or less uh, all this, this kind of problems in our islands here in the Caribbean, in the Antilles. Uh, okay, wild fire is not very important for climatic uh, for climatic reason, but volcanic flooding, of course, storm, hurricanes, whatever you want, earthquakes, we know very well. We don't have the problem of extreme temperature discussion. We agree on that, and so it means that uh, we these are they, these are the kind of risks which, uh, including volcanoes, which actually are deadly deadly risk for us. Anyway, let's talk a little bit more about uh, uh, Guadeloupe. Guadeloupe is, uh, well, uh, an, archipel an archipelago of five main islands, an area of uh, less than 2,000 square kilometers, 32 municipalities, 400,000 inhabitants. Well, the major geological risk is, of course, 
across uh, the volcanic activity presently related to the La Sofra volcano and the seismic activity, which was uh, so well described by Joanna. Of course, we have a tsunami and landslides that can be triggered by the two geological risks I just mentioned. And of course, uh, other forcing factors are, of course, especially with the climate change, are the main meteorological risks, which are, uh, of course, uh, also the result uh, of the big uh, exposure to, to cyclone, uh, to cyclones, hurricane, and tropical storms. And uh, all this, uh, they can promote secondary side effects like uh, seawater surges, waves, uh, marine floods that, uh, well, can erode the coastal zone. This is a big problem in Guadeloupe, but of course, in all of our, I say our islands. And uh, again, heavy rainfall, which often leads to inland flutes and landslides. Anyway, so it means that there is a, a competition or even a feedback, unfortunately, a positive feedback between some of these risks. Here we try to summarize how the meteorological hazard and the geological hazard, they can interact. They can interact on our island. This is from a study specific on Guadeloupe. And we see that uh, in the common area, in the intersection uh, domain, uh, we have the landslides, of course, uh, which sometimes is uh, a little bit uh, under-evaluated. So we have volcanic seismic activity, tsunami landslide on one side, and again, tsunami, uh, again, landslide, uh, all the problems related to the coastal erosion, continental flutes, uh, all flooding and cyclones on the other side. So uh, it's a lot. Uh, of course, there can be the concomitance of independent events, so a cascading of possible scenarios. And so there are many studies uh, to understand, of course, the impact, the, the side effects uh, in this cascading uh, process. For example, a so-called minor earthquake like uh, magnitude six can uh, trigger landslide along the main prince, along one of the main roads of, of Guadeloupe. Guadeloupe is not plenty of roads. So you understand that also in terms of resilience, in terms of, well, all the activities, even from a logistical point of view, that have to put in place in case of uh, risk events, uh, well, the impact of, the, of, of transportation is something which is a central to Guadeloupe. And then we see that, for example, uh, magnitude six in Guadeloupe, well, can lead to uh, a tremendous, actually, landslide uh, hazard and then risk on uh, one of the main uh, roads. Uh, this is an example from, uh, from the northern part of the island. But again, if we want to target uh, all the, the possible uh, chain, the tree of event impact uh, scenarios that are possible for Guadeloupe. We have uh, the two main risks. I don't want to consider the volcanic one for the moment. I don't want to take into account the volcanic one for the moment. It's earthquake and landslides. That can have, may have meteorological antecedents. And then of course they can produce, uh, well, uh, both electrical cuts, of course, uh, uh, blockage of roads in, in some cases. So they can produce, of course, casualties. They can cut the lifelines. That's the point. They can cut the lifelines. And they, of course, uh, uh, at that moment, uh, they produce a huge, uh, well, uh, an important spectrum of logistical needs, uh, such as available shelters, shelters that are needed, available hospital and treatment in the hospital, and so on. And in the end, the two main, uh, I would say, the two main impacts that we can have in Guadeloupe, but like uh, well, all of our islands, such as induced, induced homelessness and induced, of course, the casualties. Anyway, an example of uh, how these uh, risks can be, well, in a way associated. Uh, well, we have uh, some minor landslides which are associated with the passage of Irma. And we too also as an observatory, which are in charge of uh, monitoring, have been impacted, deeply impacted by the passage, uh, the transit of, uh, in our case, Maria, but uh, well, Irma in the case of San Barthelemy affected uh, our stations in the Northern Ireland. Uh, well, you see, well, this is the observatory in 2017 uh, after the transit of the Maria Maria hurricane. Sorry, I say Maria, but it's Maria hurricane. And well, we had some kind of total blackout for a few days, which means that there was no actually monitoring. We had the backup, we got the backup from Martinique. But uh, our, I would say, strategy to survive was, of course, uh, 
useless at that moment because of Mara and now we have made all the intervention we needed to be resilient as much as possible in case of a similar uh, similar uh, hurricane should decide decide to to come to visit us here and anyway the point is that the major point is that of course uh, because of uh, of an event like Mariah, there was a blackout about the surveillance of all the other geological risks. So anyway, this is something that uh, uh, we have now learned from this lesson. Well, we sh I should spend, but I don't have time. Uh, we should spend time to discuss about, uh, well, the governance of the risk of the monitoring uh, in the French, so-called the French island, uh, uh, islands. Because, because I think that uh, at this level, it should be also important to think about uh, the integration of the different strategies for risk management and so on. Well, I don't have so much time. Just I want to tell you that the monitoring of the main, the main phenomena, meteorological or geological, is under the responsibility of National, Observatory, Net National Observatories Network, which means, uh, well, the, for example, Volcanological Seismological Observatory for the, for the geological side, Meteo France for uh, the meteorological side, for the, uh, well, for the meteorological risks. So a national observatory, which has a local branch in the archipelago, in Guadeloupe, same as for Martinique, eh? okay? It's the same uh, philosophy, of course. Uh, so we have to provide, of course, uh, we have to monitor the hazard and to provide advice, scientific expert advice to the authority, the prefect, which, uh, who is the person, the institution uh, authorized to, of course, give uh, issue an alert level, okay? This is for geological risks and for hurricanes, and including, of course, the Meteo France, for floods and landslides, which are perceived as a secondary hazard, while the monitoring is much less implemented, this is a problem because um, it's neglected a little bit too much. And the role of municipalities is much more relevant. If you look at the figure, you see that the municipal level is the core level at the center, is well the smallest one, but also the, the closest one to the territory, to the needs of the territory. Okay, so the municipalities it, uh, knows very well the local problem. Anyway, I don't waste time about this just to tell you that uh, there are many people doing many things in my opinion even too many some uh, rationalization would be necessary but this is my personal uh, point of view and i endorse what i'm saying that there is two fragmentation but uh, well this is the way it works not so bad eh? not so bad but sometimes you know it's like a microprocessor a cpu in a computer if the architecture uh, the architecture is too fragmented well, the speed of the process is reduced. Anyway, in Guadeloupe, when forecasting is possible, we provide, of course, an advice to the prefect who will, who will announce the level of alert. It's okay. And in case, so we provide, for example, some kind of, it's not a shake map, but uh, looks like. And uh, in case it's needed, there is a, a emergency plan, an organization for civil and security response or SEC plan which is a very responsive, I would say, action procedure, which is put in place to face, uh, of course, the phenomenon and all the risk it has produced. And so, and you go through this chain, which is sometimes a little bit complicated, but it works. Volcanic risk, we have already seen this slide by John, if I remember well, or by Pat. Uh, just to tell you, look at the left, at the right panel, just to tell you that La Soufriere is anyway the one which has the most risky conditions simply because the people in the surrounding of the volcano, well, are the most numerous, okay? So we have the largest diameter, the circle, the circle with the largest diameter. We are not saying that is a good thing, but anyway, it's a major issue for a volcano, which anyway is in a state of unrest since many, many years more than 20 years, and this is La Soufrière de Guadeloupe. Uh, this is a photograph taken by a drone. Well, uh, I think that uh, it speaks for itself. It's plenty of fumaroles. There are new fumaroles in port which are, which generate through, through years. Well, what we have- Marati, we... sorry to interrupt. You have five minutes left. Okay, I'll do my best, but don't trust me. Anyway, since uh, in the last 400 years, uh, 
Lassufer gave us only phreatic eruptions, which is good, but anyway, there are magmatic scenarios which must be considered because uh, the, the, the similarity, the analogy, if you compare Primat and Bastel, if you compare Soufriris and Soufriris de Guadeloupe, well, some similarities, of course, are there. And so you should remember that, for example, the dome forming eruption of uh, 1530, the eruption who formed the, the present dome of La Soufre, on La Soufre de Guadeloupe was very similar to the still ongoing, theoretically still ongoing eruption of La Soufre Rives in Montserrat. Anyway, we are doing nice things to face at least the long-term hazard, to assess the long-term hazard, including some uh, physical numerical simulations. This is made uh, by, with the help, uh, actually was led by Italian colleagues from uh, National Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology in, uh, in Italy. And so eruptive scenarios can, on the long term, can be defined, of course, also by using the some deterministic approach. But of course, our main interest, because we do monitoring, is the short term hazard assessment, which is the realm of monitoring networks, and of course, the volcanic observatory. We do many things, seismology, geochemistry, thermal monitoring, geodesy. Well, we are only 15, but we do many things. Anyway, all this is included within, uh, uh, I would say, this is from the ORSEC plan, within, uh, well, I don't know how to say, within the logics, the trees of the procedure, if, uh, if an alert, a volcanic alert is issued. So of course we give the information to, to the um, local civil protection services, which uh, will activate all the needed procedure. And of course the alert levels are the typical ones based on four colors uh, with, there is not, with a lot of fantasy, it's green, yellow, orange, and red. And this applies of course to all the uh, overseas observatories of IPGP. Communication is, of course, a major issue, simply because, uh, you know, when you go from, uh, for example, that's the point, I go straight to the point. When you go from uh, green to yellow, the difference between the, the, uh, the difference between the amount of information in the phenomenon you observe and the perception of the authority is very small, very, very small. You see, we are here, A. So the context is clear to everybody. There is a full agreement. Then you evolve through the yellow. You evolve through the yellow. The physical phenomenon evolves. So you are in unrest. A lot of changes of work. The system evolves dramatically in many cases, but you are still in the yellow. At some point, you must, re you must recall to your <clears throat> partner, the authority, hey, you are still in yellow, uh, but you know that there are all these things that are occurring Oh, come on, at that moment can be dramatic because there are some kind of unexpected changes that have uh, occurred. The context uh, is no more like in A, the authority was not expecting uh, a context like in B. And so what I mean is that we have to be careful because yellow is a, is a very big box in which many, many things occur, uh, exist, uh, occur from a physical point of view, but for the authority is still yellow. And so there could be, there is the big risk is that there there can be some uh, communication reporting mismatches, some uh, misunderstandings. And so this is to be avoided because of course, what we are saying, even if it comes from very nice information from the monitoring, is affected by a lot of uncertainty. If there is a something very difficult to, to explain, especially when you see an evolution, is the uncertainty because you have to explain, to tell the guy, hey, we are supposing that we are slowly, slowly going to here, but this can occur before or it can even abort. So it's the maximum is uncertainty. And this is not easy at all. And this is what happened also in 76 to 77, which is a very scholar exam scholastic example of mismanagement of a volcanic crisis, but I will skip this. La, La Soufriere is now evolving. Many things are occurring. Many new fumaroles, some new fumaroles, have, have appeared. So we are in unrest, strong unrest. In 2018, in 2018, you see that the, the energy versus time diagram, the seismic energy diagram is calculated in a logarithm on a logarithmic scale. I'm sorry for the quality of the figure. But you see that uh, a magnitude uh, an earthquake magnitude four 
in 2018 was actually the most energetic event, I can tell you, of the last 42 years. And it, it was a felt in the, in the entire Guadeloupe, especially in the Buster part of Guadeloupe. So many people were afraid that we are going back to the situation, the volcanic crisis of 76, 77, when 70,000 people were evacuated, almost evacuated for nothing. We have to, to remind this. And so a lot of concern. Now the situation is pretty nice, I would say, not nice because the unrest is still evolving, but compared to that uh, seismic activity, seems quiet, but it's not, uh, it uh, seems quiet. But if we look at the energy, we see that, uh, well, in the end, uh, the, we have uh, a lot of seismicity, similar to the one uh, in Martinique described by Fabrice Fontaine, but in terms of energy, the energy release uh, is very little. It's, around, uh, it's about one watt. So if you want to plug your iPhone, uh, your smartphone, and try to, try to recharge it, uh, well, you don't get it. <laughs> anyway, this was enough to provide expert advices to the prefecture who decided to close the Soufriere summit. Only authorized people like us sorry, can go Dr. there. Dr. Moretti, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, your time is up, but we'd like you to wrap up. It's all very interesting. You, you, you give me two slides to conclude. So the okay. point is that what we have to do, of course, is to understand now all these scenarios in terms of resilience. Resilience, there are many definitions of resilience. I would say that resilience is some kind of performance versus time, which must be restored, maintained, or even increased. The performance should include also the well being, but this is another matter. And to boost our resilience, we should anticipate the event. Resilience has a cost. I'd like to talk about this later with you, because not necessarily greater resilience. Is, necess is necessary because it has also a greater cost. There must be some good compromise. And because of this, I would say that the economic shock should then be used as an opportunity to rapidly reassess the post-disaster economy. For example, by relocating tourism or agriculture, okay? And uh, so to anticipate and minimize, of course, early warning of earthquakes, and tsunamis as well. This can be done because we are in the sea by using optical seismometer placed in the sea, because we can, do, at that moment, we can do real-time seismic monitoring in the sea. And then, but here I will leave also to one of our hosts, we can use ionospheric sounding in order, based on seismic, and in particular on GNSS data, GPS data, to have a, well, a early, early warning tool for earthquakes and particularly for tsunamis. And for us, it's highly important, important. We hope to implement our volcanological and seismological observatory also into an ionospheric observatory, because this is a wonderful tool. Uh, close colleague to, uh, and a close friend will maybe uh, tell a few words during the general session. And uh, we have to be resilient. This is good for agriculture. This is good uh, for all of us, because there are many risks we are facing. And this is the last slide. We probably should learn from Montserrat, because they have been able to turn the problem, the volcanic eruption, into business, more or less. And uh, by adopting uh, what is, what's called the ash to cash approach, which means green energy, sand mining, because in the end, there is a lot of quartz and of course, to relocating the agriculture. And so this is a good example of how to be resilient uh, if, we, if we think about it, uh, remembering that we are at the same time, few people, perhaps in some uh, islands in the ocean, but we are also very good attractors of risk. I finished. Wow, thank you, Dr. Moretti. What a wealth of knowledge and thank you for taking us over almost a century of events. Um, and also pointing to some very interesting solutions uh, and even benefits that we can get from this um, tragic uh, uh, and foreboding uh, event, which, which seems to be, uh, as, as all the events <laughs> we've heard so far, seem to be um, at our doorstep. And uh, it, again, requires uh, uh, a regional response. It requires a response of policymakers. So we have a lot of expertise here from the technical persons, and we've seen the need to coordinate 
I was quite interested in your comments about the fragmentation um, of responses, uh, the need to have a more rationalization of responses, and also the need to um, introduce or reduce the uncertainties also for those who are the decision makers in responding to these, uh, these yeah. events. I would like now to introduce uh, Ronald Jackson. He is uh, 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 speaking with us all the way from uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and uh, no stranger to the region, an expert in all things disaster re uh, reduction. And uh, he's going to speak with us on a regional engagement with the international community on disaster risk reduction. So I would like, I already introduced him at the beginning of the session, and now I invite him to make his comments. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Thank, thank you, Madam Moderator. And let me add my voice of thanks to you and the leadership for including me in this very important discussion with, with our experts from the region. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about you know, bridging this relationship between the region and the international actors. Um, and I, I won't spend too much time. Are you able to see my slides first and foremost? Yes. 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 We're seeing your slides and hearing you loud and clear. I'm wondering why my. So you, you've heard about the, the the events from all of our technical speakers. You know those talking about seismic events, volcanoes. You haven't heard the the, the climate related hazards, but essentially what we see is that it takes a significant toll on on our region. And I'm just showing you there between 2000 and 2019, what the countries in the region have had to face as a percentage of GDP. And you know, this is all about development. It, it's, it's where risk, vulnerability and development collides. And we're seeing the, the, the ravages of this and, and COVID certainly will add to that when we are able to uh, eventually tot up the losses associated with COVID because you know, you know, we're going through various cycles. People talk about recovery from COVID. It's a, it's a stop start process and we won't see that recovery uh, for some time to come based on the impact it's having. So what we're seeing are certainly system altering global threats and it's playing out in the theater here in the Caribbean, most certainly. Whether we call them natural hazards, um, pandemic threats, food security related issues, cyber threats, what is important is that we need to look at the balance and feedback loops between hazard, exposure, and vulnerability in constructing different risk contexts. We need to look at who is vulnerable and the multiple faceted needs that are being driven here. We need to look at the risk drivers, including the role of informality. I noted a question in the chat around informal settlements, but they're, they're in informal economies and how this is also shaping the current situation and trajectory that we see. So what does the future look like for us as risk managers? This is certainly a question we have to ask ourselves. So we're dealing with transboundary issues. We're dealing with uh, interconnected issues. We refer to it now as multidimensional risk. Some people will call it cascading risk. And COVID again brought that squarely in front of us. It, all it did was again, remove the veneer that we were um, you know, blinded by, that we weren't tackling some of these underlying drivers and some of the inequalities that we have seen. So the complex world that we're, we're, we're now dealing with is, is really calling upon us to, to move beyond the current risk management regimes that, that we, we are, we're using. I heard one of your speakers talk about governance and risk governance. You know, are we in a position to be able to deal with the, the governance of systemic risk that we are now seeing and, and the multidimensional nature of the threats we are seeing? Are we having to deal with the, the perceptions, the potential trade-off between development decisions, policies, and the types of investments that we have to, to take on, you know, the whole political economy of dealing with, with disaster-related issues. 
So before I, I go to examine a little bit more about this interface between regional and international actors, I, I need to share a little bit about the UN. Um, many of you may know um, what UNDP is about particularly. But we are a development agency present in 170 countries globally. Um, we feel we offer bespoke services to address national needs within the frame of what we refer to as development solutions, as distinct from our humanitarian organizations. And we really seek to have sustained engagement with national and subnational and sectoral agencies primarily, as we are a, a functionary of, of member states. And so this is one of the reasons why we're located in so many different places across the world. Um, there are those who feel that much of our work takes place within the space where we see much of the global crisis occurring. Some people use the term fragility, sensitive term, but it is said that this is where the UN does most of its work. We have six signature solutions, um, which drives our, our development support work on poverty, governance, um, of course, resilience, as you would have heard from some of the earlier speakers, environment, energy, and gender, all being delivered within an integrated context, especially when you look at the work done specifically at our country office level, where by necessity, they have to integrate all of these particular um, pieces uh, in, in, in the diverse development settings within which they work. Some of the support we offer is within the realm of technical and financial assistance, as you can see, and it ranges from uh, not only providing financing, but also personnel um, looking at the full spectrum of disaster risk management from normatives all the way through to recovery and reconstruction support. And of course, on the ground, looking at some of the community-based preparedness and capacity development support. We have varied partnerships, um, ranging from the CADRI, which is a capacity for uh, disaster uh, resilient uh, initiative, which is a, I think, 13 member UN initiative. And so this is a space where the UN is collectively supporting governments in the area of doing capacity assessment. So a demonstration of the one UN approach in that particular space. The Risk-Informed Early Action Partnership, which is again a multi-UN partnership around uh, looking at climate change and disaster risk reduction and how we can collectively attain an objective of reducing the vulnerability and risk to uh, a large portion of our population globally. The CRUISE Initiative, which is a, a early warning uh, initiative Inform, which looks at risk information and how we can use this to better um, inform our decisions from financing risk to responding. The Guard, which is the Getting Airports Ready, which is a flagship, a private sector engagement flagship, the DHL, that looks at airport readiness. And the PDNA is the, the um, Post Disaster Needs Assessment and Partnership, which we have with the World Bank. Uh, some new IFIs are coming on stream and the EU. And then there's the platform for disaster displacement, especially when we talk about these transboundary related issues of migration. This is also very important and the international recovery platform. So what have we learned um, in, in, in recent times and that we should really be paying key attention to? The pandemic, and, and I, I lifted this quote, um, certainly, um, the pandemic can be understood as a warning sign a probe into the structural weaknesses of our existing systems, and it shows how futile it is to insist on facing the 21st century challenges with the institutions and methods of the 20th century global governance. And I think this has come out very squarely in a lot of the presentations before me. You know, I listened to Joan very carefully where she questioned, you know, whether we had fit for purpose institutions and systems um, in dealing with the, the, the disaster risk management landscape. And even as Sadima is to be commended, not only for being the first, but for also addressing this, this roadmap towards resilience and putting together perhaps one of the most, one of the first coherent strategies. There's still the question of how, how well it can bridge some of the 
governance challenges that exist on the ground. So we need to look at our approaches, our systems, our risk governance methods, and to revamp them to deal with the, the journey in this 21st, 21st century. For us at UNDP, this has motivated us to really look at our own work. Um, you know, in fact, there's currently within, within the UN in the framing of our new strategic plan, 2022 to 2025, a rethink around many of our signature solutions, our way of working, uh, and, and asking ourselves some, some key questions as we get ourselves fit for purpose for the, for the journey forward. Certainly within the team I lead, we've been looking at our VRM priorities and we have focused at the global level. And let me be clear here, we have, we have a global policy team, which is part of the global policy network, uh, driving those six major solutions I spoke about. Then we have regional hubs, and then we have country offices. Uh, and at the country office level, they respond to diverse demands or from from governments uh, and, and the communities of actors that they support. But at the global level, we tend to look more at the policy and the practice. How can we strengthen the practice? And so my team is looking at the policy and practice strengthening. And these are some of the priorities we've settled on going forward, looking at this risk governance arrangement, which, you know, again, as I said to you, our environmental scan and COVID required us to take a look at that and looking at our recovery program, you know, looking at it from a resilient recovery lens. And so these are the areas we will be focusing on and seeing digital transformation um, as a process for delivering what we call our gender sensitive integrated disaster risk reduction services in fragile and non-fragile settings. Within that context, we have some emerging products that are coming out, um, looking at strengthening governance of systemic risk. And this is currently in design. We have uh, a, a panel of academics which will be meeting soon to examine some of the outputs of our framing of this particular piece. Um, we are going back five years forward in strengthening our risk-informed development approach. And you know, we've gone through an extensive consultative process. We've invited externals, including academia and the Caribbean, to join that particular session. And I don't know how many people really went on our, on our platform and shared their views, but we've been harvesting perspectives and views wide, widely afield to co-create um, the next phase of our risk-informed development approach. And we're currently in a consultative process around our urban resilience program. And here we're going beyond the concept of disaster risk reduction solely to look at this multidimensional nature of the problem. The urban spaces is, is the current and will be the future space of representation of this multidimensional problem that we're facing. And so we're, we're really looking at, at articulating a UNDP approach to this, um, but also looking at how we connect the dots and work with others. And we've developed the- Sorry to interrupt, we have four minutes left. Four minutes, uh, I'll get there for sure. And then, of course, we're looking at some of our digital solutions. Um, within the UN, we have the capacity um, for um, our AI, artificial intelligence lab, and our, um, our SDG integrator team, and our innovations team that we are pulling on to, to, to help develop some of these tools. So as we discuss this interface between regional and international, one of the the starting points, I think, for this partnership, we look at this issue of disaster risk reduction, has to be the two major um, you know, regional pieces of, of strategic documents, the CARICOM strategic plan, and the new one I hear is endorsed and should be coming out soon. And of course, the CDM strategy, which is seeking to deliver the, the DRR component. Um, as regional or international organizations, we have the, the, the ability to work either at the, the strategic priorities level in integrating risk-informed approaches, but also simultaneously in tackling the, the elements associated with disaster risk, in particular with CARICOM and its functionaries. And so some of the potential areas of support if we're looking to the future is in the area of strategic direction that the region needs to take, supporting country governments, 
uh, which is central to how the UN works, providing strategic support. And this could be not just from a financing point of view, but also technical expertise, mobilizing experts from our Express roster, um, which is agile and fast, including what we call tandem teams, co-creating initiatives with, with CARICOM partners and functionaries, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and resource mobilization support. What, what is the value proposition? So with UNDP having 170 country offices, we have the ability to bring good practices and lessons learned, not just only in the positive side, but also where our approaches may have failed and we've learned lessons from that that can help navigate the, the, the way forward. Um, amplifying the voice and message of our regional organizations, both within their member government, governments. We know that the issue of disaster risk is often not a sexy topic within the political realm, but through UNDP's reach, it can also partner with, with these organizations to amplify that message there, but also in the global space. Uh, providing cutting edge technological support and ideas uh, to our regional partners for piloting and bringing a, what I call a neutral, non-political support to the implementation of initiatives. Where do we see challenges? Because this partnership is not without its challenges. Um, tensions around service offers. And, and here, the regional organizations were not traditional partners, I would say, of international organizations. By virtue of how we are set up, we're both serving member governments, and there was a tendency to work only with the member governments. So that in itself would, would create certain tensions, a sense of competition, which, which I think we have to watch out for, we have to guard against. The evolving financing environment. So we know that resources are declining. Um, and so there's, there's, there's less to do more. And I think here we have to look at this particular shaping of the development financing environment and to see how we can join up our efforts um, in a much more meaningful way to go beyond this thinking that it's only about money. Um, there are other ways of better planning uh, and that can lead to better implementation beyond simply the financing. Expectations, um, you know, where we see variability in terms of the capacity of regional institutions and UN country offices that may impact on our, our expectations of what we can and cannot deliver, um, whether or not we are able to finance like the IFIs or not able to finance like the IFIs. Their ability and technical capacity. And I think this one, the whole idea of conceptual coherence. In the global space, there are a lot of terms that are used, resilience being one of them, but different understanding of the terminology that can impact on our ability to work, work collectively. In wrapping up, um, what, what are my final messages in terms of this partnership? Um, I think we have a shared commitment, which is two member states. Um, it is also expressed certainly within the taglines of all the organizations, CARICOM, um, the UN, UNDP, and in this case, Sabima, look, we're looking at disaster risk around resilience and saving lives. We can use that as a bridge um, to, to build our partnership. We need to look at building strong, measurable partnerships and not be focused on competing. Um, we shouldn't see this as a competition. Accountability has to be the fundamentals if we want to be successful. Accountability to shared principles and to these, these shared commitments and, and, and measuring uh, so for success. Uh, development solutions that are risk informed. Um, this is what UNDP would bring to the table and can bring to the table and can help regional organizations to, to deliver. And of course, a systems approach, putting people at the center uh, and this new risk governance approach that we're developing. Uh, which is necessary to deal with this multidimensional challenge that we face. Thank you for uh, allowing me 15 minutes to share some thoughts with you. Um, and I avail myself for any questions in the discussion session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jackson. This has been very helpful understanding the UNDP's perspective on risk management, disaster risk management, particularly as you know, um, fascinated with the concept of governance. And that was one of the things that you highlighted quite a bit in your presentation, risk governance, and the importance of the identifying the actors and the actors working together cooperatively, recognizing the limitations, but also leveraging each other's uh, strengths uh, to deliver on the, the intent or the desire of the country 
um, the governments which these organizations uh, uh, represent and, uh, and work on behalf of. And so, ladies and gentlemen, fellow panelists and attendees, we've had a fantastic round of conversations, presentations thus far from uh, illustrious panelists. I'd now like to ask uh, Dr. Karen Niles from the Institute of International Relations to summarize or to give some perspectives based uh, on, his, uh, on his understanding of what has been said so far um, of the presentations that we've had. And uh, in the meantime, we've had a series of questions coming in from our over 100 and almost 20 participants now. And uh, we're going to refine those and uh, address them to the panel. Those of you who haven't yet um, asked your questions in the chat, you can please do so. And now I'd like to um, ask Dr. Niles to make some comments, a critical analysis summary of the main points discussed by the panelists. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to our panelists for indeed very thought provoking contributions. Uh, my name is Carol Niles. I'm with the Institute of International Relations. And uh, I still remember what it felt like to be in a house that was shaking and you were wondering what on earth to do. As, I remember, as a matter of fact, I I remember that, that, was, that on that singular day, I received no less than 15 links to the UE Seismic Research Center and uh, Facebook Live sessions that they were doing. I also remember that night in 2018 when Trinidad and Tobago, or Trinidad in particular, um, was shaken by an earthquake, um, that even the news anchor on that night was shaking um, when he was delivering it talking about what had happened. We're very reactive sometimes. And uh, when the incident happened, when the incidents like these happen, um, then we tend to jump into action. Because it's easy to kind of take action when you've been started or when you are been, been traumatized or shaken, sometimes literally. I tend to focus on climate change um, as an area of, of specialization. But one of the things that we that we we have in common in terms of planning is when I, I really try to encourage persons, it's easy to sit back and take an academic perspective of these challenges when everything is fine. But I want you to think a bit deep more deeply about what you've heard from from the first presentation that Mr. Ashman gave all the way down to the last presentation from Mr. Jackson. Because when I was listening to them, I, I still remembered um, one of the more senior uh, members of, of staff at the Organization of American States. Uh, when we, we, had, we had to go to a meeting together, and he said to me that we have to find a way of ensuring that natural events do not become natural disasters. Because these things are going to happen. And I, as you heard from, from Ms. Latchman, from Dr. Latchman, sorry, as you from Dr. Latchman, uh, in geological timeframes, it, uh, it's eminent. And so what I tend to look at, similar to Dr. Scooby, is the issue of governance. But before even diving into summarizing some of what we've heard before and today about governance, I think it's really important to kind of underscore that we're not ignoring your personal responsibility to educate yourself and to take responsibility and to, be, to build resilience. Because as Dr. Moretti said, um, resilience is important. You need to boost your resilience. And, but resilience has a cost. It also has a personal cost, not just the government. And I think that's important to underscore that when we are uh, looking at these issues across different paints or, or two different lens, there's an individual lens. There's a lens to which we look at the civil society, which is Again, looking, just critically looking back at what we talked about today, uh, when we talk about the cooperation between individual civil society and governments, and then in regional organizations and international organizations, that makes us think more deeply about the fragmentation that was referred to. And so how do we all work together to keep everyone safe and to ensure there is no loss of life? So, so certainly, um, to borrow a term 
that 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 um, Mr. Jackson used, you know, about the governance of systemic risk. You know, it's it's thinking through whether or not, and this is again stretching from the first presentation or to the last. A lot of a lot of the presentations presentations today focused on whether or not the governance the governance piece of our equation is really and truly fit for purpose. Is it fit for purpose? Our institutions, our processes, our systems fit for purpose. I know many people from, from Trinidad and Tobago are wondering about the whether or not a building code will help us to be more ready and fit for purpose. But Trinidad and Tobago is not unique in, in, in terms of our approach. In terms of our approach to planning, in terms of our approach to building resilience, and what structures we allow to be built and how we allow them to be built. I think as citizens, and for those of you in the Caribbean, as Caribbean citizens, you have a responsibility to demand that your governments, your institutions are indeed fit for purpose and working together, not fragmented, not competing for budgets, but working together to build resilience across the region. Because I, I think what I would do to just wrap this up, because I, I don't intend to take it on at all. Um, a lot has been said. And I just kept taking notes and realizing that you cannot e eliminate risk. So now we find ourselves in between geological, geological risk, meteorological risk in terms of climate risk, and then public health risk. Now as we, we, we find ourselves as responding to COVID-19. And so you have to respond in, in a manner that allows you to still maintain your resilience to, to the global pandemic that we're going through now, while planning for the next earthquake that might happen or the next hurricane that is going to occur when the hurricane season fully gets on the way. And so that planning is important, but what's also important and what we heard from many of the participants today and many of the panelists was that cooperation is equally as important information sharing is equally as important. And so I think in, a, in my own reflections on what I heard today, I want you to think back for yourself in terms of what this, what this means for your own landscapes, for your own um, realms of influence and for governance as it relates to your own country of origin and also to our region. For those persons that are from the Caribbean region listening in, I think it's important that we think about these things holistically and that we take the time really and truly to think about what it actually means to account for hazards and risk. And you hear Dr. Moretti said that we are attractors of risk, as he said, so the risk is inevitable. But we have to find a way of ensuring that these natural events do not become natural disasters that take lives. And I think I'll end there. Thank you, Dr. Niles, for those reflections. Uh, and indeed, we've had such a rich uh, uh, round of panel presentations. Uh, and uh, the questions are, are so many, we have just 10 minutes to go. So I'm going to just pull out a few of the questions. And uh, I'd like uh, the attendees to know that the, this, uh, this seminar will be available on the YouTube channel of the Institute of International Relations. And uh, so I'd just like to, to point to, to a few of the questions and maybe um, ask the panelists to, to choose one or two of them in the order in which they, the panelists spoke to respond to the questions. So we have questions, for example, questions, a question from Z. Alvarez Pereira on science communication how to bridge the gap between the scientific community and citizens, what would be the best channel to communicate warnings and evacuations, probably considering matters from a, a regional perspective. And then we have Usha Lachman asking about how Caribbean governments can be encouraged to enforce things like building codes to reduce disasters and whether informal settlements, which are so much uh, a reality in the Caribbean, can be reduced or dealt with in a way that can 
uh, increase community resilience. Uh, we also have a question from Professor Byron, the uh, Director of the Institute of International Relations, asking about the similarities between the 1902 events in Pele and in Martinique and Soufre and St. Vincent and what is happening now. Is there a subterranean connection between those two volcanoes? And she also asked about the cooperation within a wider Caribbean region on monitoring such disasters, i.e. we've seen um, a lot of uh, monitoring at the national level, but the extent to which there's cooperation between uh, the agencies in the region on this. Um, I, I just like the panelists to hear about the feedback and some of the questions. So I'll continue with some more questions. How do you explain us, Henry Gaduru, um, about uh, the similarity between the eruptive activity in Soufre, St. Vincent, and the recent activity in Mont Pelé, uh, regional seismicity and seismicity. And this question has already been answered by Dr. Fontaine, but it echoes the question by Professor Byron. Jude Eversley asked about shelters and uh, people moving to shelters in the context of COVID. And Ms. Riley, I'm sure with your um, recent uh, work on COVID as part of response of the region to that pandemic. I'm sure that you may have something to say about pandemics and, uh, and shelters. And uh, Ruben Martoredo asked about the Caribbean region prone to natural hazards and hurricanes. And uh, he says that I noticed that no regional facilities present to assist communities affected by disasters, especially the vulnerable ones in their efforts of socioeconomic rebuilding, housing and livelihoods. So I imagine that Mr. Jackson, you might have something to say about that the regional response after an event. And finally, we have a question, well, not finally, but I'm gonna highlight a question from Philemon Mullen, which is, can Caribbean, can CARICOM do more to encourage member states to reduce risk, even in an environment of competing for foreign direct investments? And that I think responds to the question, the, the issue raised by Mr. Jackson on the fact that agencies really shouldn't compete. And I guess Mr. Mullen is speaking to about governments competing for limited resources. So we have a, a short uh, time frame before we close, but I'd like to invite our speakers in the order in which uh, you spoke to perhaps choose one of the questions that were raised that perhaps more fit your area of expertise and give us some very brief, maybe one minute uh, responses to those. So based on the order in which the presentations were made, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Lachman to, to, to make some comments. Thank you, Dr. Scobie. So indeed, we have observed these associations of volcanic unrest, not just eruption, at our systems in the Eastern Caribbean. And no, there is no underground channel that connects the volcanoes. The volcanic processes are as a result of the subduction, as I showed in the slide earlier, subduction of the North American, South American plates. So that is what they do have in common. As Dr. Fontaine alluded to, and it is a mechanism to which I am subscribing more and more strongly, I'm of the opinion that the volcanoes are loading their systems progressively and at certain stages in their evolution, they become critically poised. And when they are critically poised, then they are susceptible to triggers. And these triggers can come from earthquakes along the Caribbean plate boundary. And if you look closely at it, you will observe of course, there will have to be more scientific investigation to be more confident of this. You will see that in 1902, there was a greater earthquake in Central America preceding those two eruptions. And across time, it is becoming more evident that such activities at play. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. It clarified things, made it just doesn't um, assuage our, our worries, but at least it clarifies the, the sort of unity, I guess, between the region based on those techno 
tectonic plates. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lachman. May I ask Dr. Miss, Miss Riley to respond uh, to some of the questions that were raised, particularly those relating to cooperation? Yeah, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, so I, I, I picked out two as you were going through. So there were some specific questions with respect to building codes, and I, I think that's a very important issue um, on the resilience agenda. Um, so I think there's sort of two lenses you have to look at that through because on the side of uh, construction that's taking place through formal channels, etc., I do think there's a need to institutionalize the arrangements for enforcement. And this is something that a number of Caribbean governments have been moving in the right direction. Um, outside of that formal building arrangement, of course, building codes are still important. And you know how we are in the Caribbean, we get together in the rural areas and we work together to assist our neighbors or family with construction, et cetera. And tackling that is a bit more of a complex problem, but I don't think insurmountable. And what we've been doing is working at bringing the trio of government arrangements um, the working with artisans who are supporting construction in that type of arrangement and also home or homeowners. And this is something we've been um, engaging in with CROSSQ, the CARICOM Regional Organization for Standards and Quality, and also with um, other partners on and including our post-secondary institutions through um, uh, training and that type of thing. So there's, there's quite a bit on that that's been happening. Um, the second part of the question um, sort of speaks a little bit more to the underlying driver, drivers of risk where we're talking a little bit about the informal settlements and of course uh, poverty is a more complex issue to tackle but also one that must be tackled as you saw in our resilience pillars when we're discussing um, the, the matters of risk and of course that has to be driven through the infusion of resilience as an underlying pillar within our economic development programs. Um, just very quickly on the shelter issue, I think that was one of the other ones that you had raised. Um, and the, the answer is yes, we've done a, a quite a bit of work last year, particularly coming into the hurricane season on treating with the revisit of the shelter management arrangements. We, we've run shelter management training and then revision of guidelines within the context of COVID, particularly with the assistance of CARFA. And this is also an example of the, the regional cooperation as well, which worked very well. And um, really reorienting shelter managers because uh, they have to be able to enforce those protocols. And countries uh, also uh, went through various processes, including um, identification of new locations for shelters because of um, density requirements, etc. So those are some of the um, areas that I can highlight in responding to those issues. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Very helpful indeed. Um, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Joseph uh, to make some comments as well. So um, there was a question um, with response with regards to the communication of hazards and the best channels um, to share with the public or that works with the public. Um, so in response to that question, this was by uh, Z Alves Pereira. So what we found um, through our work in education and outreach is that visual tools seem to work well with members of the general public. Um, particularly videos and interactive tools. They are extremely useful. In the age of social media, though, what, what we found is that people expect responses very quickly, even almost in real time. And that often is a challenge. So because we, we're at the same time trying to manage the, the, the hazard and respond um, in terms of that and have to address the, the urgency of the, you know, the public request at the same time. So, so in terms of the best ways um, of communicating with the public, um, videos, social media, interactive tools, that's um, in response to that question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Joseph. Yes, indeed. It's in the age of, of images and uh, and, um, and probably having some of those tools on hand uh, before uh, the event 
can be very helpful as well. So thank you very much for that. And Zia Alves Pereira th thanked you for your, for your intervention just now as well. So thank you. Um, I'd like to ask now Dr. Fontaine, followed by Dr. Moretti to um, make some brief observations. We are at the three o'clock mark, but I think um, we would like to hear your, your responses to some of those comments and questions. Thank you. And uh, yes, yeah, so I um, come back to the, to the question about uh, a possible connection. Bit, um, and I, uh, I just agree with uh, Dr. Latchman. And as uh, there, there is no seismic, seismic image uh, showing uh, any connection uh, between uh, re magmatic reservoir um, um, uh, beneath each of these islands. Um, so, um, so it's it's good also to to know that we, we it's possible to make some seismic image, uh, like uh, uh, with a g medical uh, practi practitioner, and and presently the seismic image uh, image do not show uh, a connection uh, between um, the magmatic system of these islands. And the other point is that uh, there are other um, eruption um, uh, dates for Soufria of Saint Vincent uh, and Grenadine, um, for which uh, there was no uh, seismic um, reactivation in Martinique. For instance, 1979, there was uh, there were uh, so there, uh, there was uh, an eruption with multi-phase phases. Uh, in Soufrière, uh, uh, however, uh, there was no eruption and uh, there was n also uh, n no seismic crisis in Martinique. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's very helpful. And, and that, that historic example sort of cements that, that case that you, were, that question that you were um, being asked about. Dr. Moretti. Can we have some some comments yes. from you? Well, some comments about the questions uh, uh, we have read on the chat. So for what concerns, in my opinion, science communication, what are the best channels to communicate warnings and to perform evacuations? Well, personally, I think the best channels are official channels. So institutional channels. This is uh, my strict point of view. So. Uh, I, I say so because I think that maybe in the future there should be an evolution. This connect also to another comment, another question. There should be an evolution toward some common Caribbean center who should be also in charge to manage uh, most, uh, I would say, most of the information. Of course, not uh, uh, trespassing uh, the, the duties and the priorities of each nation but some kind of better management and coordination, including also not only, excuse me, the, your islands, also other islands, that would be great. And I think that, uh, and I think that this is important also, and I connect also to one more question, one more comment, to boost resilience, because boosting resilience, we are, we are not living in New York, okay? We are not living in Rome or in Paris. We are living more or less in, uh, I would say some kind of places in which there is also a lot of available, available space. The point is that that available space must be well structured. So there must be a lot of prevention. There should be a big, inve big investment for prevention, architectural prevention, engineering. But we can have, for example, the best uh, buildings of the world. But in the end, in the end, if a tsunami comes, you can stay there if you are close to the coastline. In the end. If you cut the main roads, you cut the main roads because I don't know, you live in Dominica, you cannot have uh, big roads like, uh, well, uh, in the central part of the United States, like in Utah or elsewhere. So, I mean, anyway, you cut the lifelines. So, we must improve, of course, uh, investment, but you, we must improve the adaptability. You must improve uh, the resilience. In, I mean, we must improve our responsiveness, our adaptability. We must be as fast as possible to react and find some kind of new, at least for a while, topological configuration, even from an economical point of view, such that the damage is limited. This is, in my opinion, the best prevention, also for another aspect. 
because in that case, if this will be, I would say, shown to the rest of the world, I should expect that it will be possible also to have much more opportunities for insurance at a good, at a good price, not a very high cost, because the insurance, of course, will be available to give you policies or whatever you want if you show that you are resilient. If you sh resilience means to be adaptable, to be well, to be flexible in some sense, but in the good way. So, well, I see. I don't know if I've been uh, <laughs> if I communicated well uh, what I have in my head, but I see some kind of continuum which, in the end, connects also all these uh, all these questions. And again, the big the main word is, in my opinion, resilience. The way resilience is managed. Thank you, Dr. Murati. Very, very interesting, passionate um, explanation of the importance of resilience and also um, community action. You know that as a having what you suggested, there a common uh, Caribbean center on some of these um, matters. Very interesting perspectives. Last but not least, Mr. Jackson, you worked in the region and outside of the region on disaster risk management. Uh, would you like to respond to one or two of the questions that have been raised thus far? Sure, I, um, in the interest of time, I put a response to one of them in the chat. Um, I want to lend some thought to the requirements for the, for the shelter approaches, because I think now we're at a stage where we do have the testing capabilities. So looking not only at hurricanes, but for any event that can generate a, a sheltering of the population, we will have to look at the redeployment of some of those testing kits, rapid test kits, to test people at the arrival of shelters, to separate the, the case from the non-case population. It will require additional facilities, as, as Liz said, but also improve logistics for movement of the people and the redeployment of the health service workers um, in that regard. That is the kind of scale of thinking we need to move to when we're thinking about biologics, not just for COVID-19, but for future um, biologics that could occur as we look at this relationship between natural hazard events, uh, pandemic, and sheltering. On the issue of, of getting governments to do more in, risk, in, in, in creating investments in risk reduction, we have to look at a partnership, public-private partnership, around this issue of the regulatory environment. The, the government, the banks, the insurance sector needs to, to form some sort of partnership that sees the enforcement of building standards um, be brought into better effect. If we don't do that, then we are going to see increasing exposure being built um, simply because much of, of that risk sits in the hands of private capital, whether they are the private sector, whether it's a private builder, a homeowner, if we're not looking at those issues, we're going to continue to build the risk exposure. So I think that is the primary role of government. If they cannot finance it out of taxpayer dollars, they have a role to play in creating the enabling environment. And that is the way we have to go, not trying to go to the to, to, to the ODI issues and to find additional but we can do it with internal resources if we think differently. So that's my my contribution to two of the questions, please. Thank you. That was so helpful, so positive. And uh, you know, from somebody from the region who understands the region and our limitations, I think that response is just spot on, you know, recognizing our strengths and the ability, the enforcement ability, the responsibility of governments to reduce the risk rather than just solving a disaster, the consequences of a disaster after it happens. So um, we need to wrap up the, the, the session today. I myself would like to continue this for a few more hours, but I do recognize that it's kind of late for you in Geneva and my colleagues in Trinidad and, and the rest of the region are also probably um, pressed for time. So I would like on behalf of the Institute of International Relations uh, to thank the panelists uh, for their fantastic presentations. I'd like to thank those working behind the scenes to make this event uh, possible. Um, I'd like to thank the attendees uh, for um, your very active uh, participation. The chat was 
going quite actively throughout the presentation, attendees asking the panelists, um, asking uh, more generally questions, making comments. We've had over 120 participants in the session today. And I think this speaks of the importance uh, of uh, the question of regional cooperation widely and more specifically disaster risk management. I certainly have learned a lot about these disasters and we chose particularly to focus on the seismic events because often we focus on the climatic ones. And so this presentation today, we, we sort of brought to the attention of everyone um, what the region is doing on the seismic front as well. We're so happy to have the panelists here today. And I'd like to let you know that this is one of many of these open lectures that uh, the IAR um, has been hosting over the over the last few um, years. And we have one coming up um, in the near future that we would be um, sending out invitations for. That is the, an inaugural Henry Gill Memorial Lecture that we are hosting together with the Sri Ramphal Center in Kefil. So we'd like you to please keep um, keep a note, look at your inboxes as we will be sending you information on that one as well. And so just let me end by once again thanking everyone for your participation today and hopefully um, some of the ideas that have come out of the session, some of the suggestions by the panelists that have come out of this of the session would be able to influence the policymakers, the diplomats that have been tuning into our presentation today, could be influenced the future um, policymakers now students who've also attended the session today. And in this way, we contribute to better governance of the region, particularly today on the issue of the disaster risk management. So on behalf of the Institute of the International Relations of the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine campus, thank you for your participation and enjoy the rest of the day, evening or afternoon. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.